Hi, this is Jason Key from SB Grid. Uh, today it's a real pleasure to have Naomi Chan from uh, Imperial College London uh, giving our webinar, and she will be telling us about simple ways to enhance your crystallization trials. So thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Jason. Well, I must say I'm amazed by this uh, modern technology which allows me to give a presentation from my desk and uh, so I'll try to show you some simple ways to enhance the success of crystallization trials. And just to introduce uh, my lab, what we do, we focus on trying to understand the crystallization process in order to develop new and improved crystallization methods. Now, uh, for that, we conduct analytical studies of the crystallization process. We design non-standard methodology for production of high-quality crystals of proteins, uh, proteins and other biological molecules. We also deal with automation and miniaturization, and of course, crystallization of difficult proteins. So what this uh, webinar will present is practical crystallization techniques that were successful when conventional methods have failed. And I would like to show the rationale for those methods to give a practical guide how we conduct them and give example of, examples of crystallization of difficult proteins. And what I would like to say that I'm trying to bring here methods that have worked not in, only in our hands, but in other people's, and that are simple and don't take you too much out of your comfort zone, because people really are a bit reluctant to try something new. It's always there's a sort of lag period. And here I'd like to show that one can do it simply and without worrying much about it. So since there's quite a large portfolio of techniques, I thought to divide the webinar into three parts, one dealing with control of nucleation, the other with dynamic experiments to maximize hits in screening and improvement of crystal quality, and then to give a guide of how to choose your method of crystallization. When do you choose which method? So I guess anybody who has ever tried to crystallize any protein or other biological molecules has encountered at least one, if not all, of these problems getting no crystals at all, getting tiny low quality crystals or precipitation, and of course getting beautiful crystals that either diffract poorly or don't diffract a single spot. So the first uh, webinar dealing with the control of nucleation, we show several techniques to tackle these problems which can easily be set up in any lab. So our strategy is uh, rather than just to set up an experiment and let it take its own course, we like to actively control the crystallization environment as the trial takes place and thereby lead crystal growth into the desired results. And in order to explain what I mean by lead crystal growth, I'd like to just briefly show you what happens in a crystallization trial. So if we take two parameters, which are um, commonly varied in crystallization experiments, i.e. protein concentration, and then where it says adjustable parameter, that's a precipitant concentration, pH, temperature, additives, or any other parameter which one changes, uh, one can experimentally obtain a 2D phase diagram, which shows schematically uh, what happens in a crystallization experiment. And what we see here really is four scenarios. One, when nothing happens at all, that's the undersaturated area, the protein is solution, he's happy, doesn't want to do anything and budge from there. Then there's a precipitation zone where too much happens. The protein just precipitates and that's it. And then there are the very crucial two zones of conditions, which are the nucleation zone and the metastable zone. The nucleation is where nuclei form. And um, of course, to have any crystallization, you first of all have to have a few nuclei which will grow into crystals. But the ideal um, conditions for growth is what we call the metastable zone, where crystals will grow, but no further nucleation will take place. And this is often the problem with uh, crystallization, that if it sits in the nucleation zone and stays there, 
then more and more nuclei form and one just gets showers of tiny crystals. Um, the lines which are um, marked by A, B, C and D are the um, representing the different crystallization methods, the four major ones, and what it shows that all the methods have got to somehow get to the nucleation zone and make their way to the metastable. And it's just their kinetics is different, i.e. they take do it via different routes. So if you take, for example, vapor diffusion B, you see it starts in, as undersaturated, and it sort of has a self-screening process. You can see it's going through the, traveling through the phase diagram where the protein concentration is going up, both and the, the, also the adjustable parameter. And then in an ideal experiment, the system gets itself to the nucleation and when just enough nuclei have formed, it takes itself into the metastable zone by protein depleting in the solution. Uh, and theoretically, this looks very well. And really, in, in 10, 20 percent of cases, it happens. But more often than not, it doesn't happen. And we have to help it along or intervene with the uh, experiment. And that's what I mean by guiding, which I will now show. So as I was saying, nucleation is the key to crystallization. It's a first step. Without it, we can't even start crystallization. Uh, and if that, um, if that is, uh, is done well, then the rest will follow. So really what we're trying to do is to control that, because this will give a handle on the process and allow us to succeed. So specific strategies for obtaining few high quality crystals is either to create an environment to limit the number of nuclei, because as we said, we don't want too many of them, or, if possible, to bypass the nucleation zone altogether, because this is a hazardous zone. Once you're there, it starts nucleating and can go too much. Um, and if one can't do that, then at least to get into the nucleation zone, but find ways of backing off before nucleation gets too much uh, in order to take it to the metastable. So, Probably the simplest method to uh, create an environment with less nuclei is just by simple filtration. And this is what I was saying. Some of these methods are just so simple that it's, 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 it's minutes to do. Uh, here we've got a case study of uh, carboxypeptidase G2, a protein which we're trying to crystallize. And if you just take the solution of it with uh, crystallizing agents, you get thousands of crystals, as you see in this table, and they're small. If you take normal practice, most people who are very uh, uh, careful what they do, they would um, filter their solution before starting the crystallization trial by a 0.22 micrometer um, filter. And that helps, but as you see, one gets 50, 70 crystals, 150, still not good enough. If you take a filter of 0.1 micrometer, just the filtration itself look can give you uh, between 1 and 14 crystals and look at the size. So it's just simple. You take, you filter, and sometimes that just solves your problem. And this has happened to us in several cases and to other people. If you go to even more stringent filters, you can get a situation where you get no crystals at all. And this is sometimes also worth doing when you want to seed. So you want to really start with nothing and then put something in the solution. But um, just as a, the most straightforward is that point one. So this is just a little sort of a do's and do don'ts of filtration that don't filter when screening, because screening you want to get anything, even if you get small or whatever, that you may, uh, if you filter, you may not get the hit, which is a pity. So first filter, get whatever, and then you can deal with the optimization. And do filter when optimizing, as the table showed, it reduces excess nucleation, and also the trial is cleaner and uh, the reproducibility is definitely enhanced. And of course, when seeding is also uh, advisable to filter. Now, um, so this is one way of doing things, but 
pro I would say the ultimate way to succeed is if you can bypass this whole nucleation zone and if you can just go direct to the metastable. And that is done already for many years by seeding and by insert, insertion of nucleating agents. Now, common conventional and common ways of seeding is, to, is by macro seeding, micro seeding, streak seeding. Now, there's also robotic uh, ways of seeding. But any seeding requires crystals uh, or crystalline material, at least, to start with. Also, often you do get the seeds and they dissolve, so it's not the, the most uh, easy way to to deal with the crystallization, but one does it, but it's, uh, we wanted to find ways which are a bit simpler. And already many uh, years ago came the idea, started with McPherson, uh, to have non-protein materials that will induce nucleation. Uh, with the purpose of one is to grow crystals at metastable conditions where slower growth and the lack of excess nucleation provide growth of better crystals and that's a way to go direct into metastable and also as a means to maximize the chances of obtaining crystals in initial screening if you put a nucleant the likelihood that it might get it stimulated to start nucleating and there's an ongoing search for what we call a universal nucleant we'd like to find something that you sort of sprinkle into any trial and get it to crystallize so Nucleants uh, work for different scenarios, as I was saying, when no crystals appear, for improvement of crystal quality, and sometimes for getting a speedier appearance of crystals. If you already can get crystals, but they take two, three weeks, you put a nucleant, it is likely to hurry it up. What is very important is the conditions for inserting the nucleants, and this sort of uh, phase diagram on the right uh, it's what we call a working phase diagram for doing experimental uh, trials. You don't need the whole phase diagram, all the undersaturated, and the, uh, that takes time and a lot of material. And for practical purposes, you really just need to know the area sort of below where, you, where nucleation takes place. And I'll tell a bit further down the line how you find that area. Um, and, and people who have done seeding, actually, that you put nucleants where you would put this crystal seeds. So those are really the conditions. Now, examples of nucleants are many. People have tried hundreds of things, minerals and zeolites and hair and sand and dust. And uh, here one sees two pictures. The first were minerals with the um, person that Schlichter did, then people did human hairs, and a variety. And they worked to various degrees, but none of them really became universal or crystallized things uh, not enough that had not crystallized before. So we set out to find some nucleants which uh, work on com a completely different mechanism than those that worked up till then. Because they were nucleants, they worked on epitaxy, they worked on charges, on various things. Um, and we came up there with the idea of using porous materials with cavities the size of protein molecules. And that was already back in 2001. Um, and the size of protein molecules are typically between 5 and 20 nanometer. And the rationale behind it was that the cavities in these materials will attract protein molecules towards them. And once several molecules will be trapped, they would form a nuclei and other molecules from the solution will migrate to the nuclei and pack to form crystals. And we set out and tried many materials and all sorts of porous materials, porous silicon, for example, proved the concept that porous materials with those kind of uh, sizes work. But as you can see on the left picture, the, um, uh, these were wafers of silicon. It was really not very elegant to put in trials, was difficult to do that. 
Uh, so we tried other things, uh, went on to carbon nanotubes, looking on your right, you can see there might be C crystals, is a myosin, uh, cardiac protein, and uh, virus protein. So it worked for those, and it looked, uh, if this is just nice to see how the crystals are with optical and even with the SCM, you can really see the pores and the crystals growing out of them. But again, they worked on some proteins, but not enough in number. So we carried on. And then came uh, an interesting, uh, I found out that somebody called uh, Professor Hench in the material science uh, department here at Imperial was working uh, on uh, bone, tissue engineering of bone, and he was um, using bioglass as a scaffold to regenerate bone tissue. And he was using uh, sizes of uh, millimeters, even centimeters. But I thought this might be interesting because if he can use it for bone, that means it's inert and biologically uh, compatible. And I called him up and I said, Larry, can you make me bioglass, but with nanometer pores with, of the size of 2 to 10 nanometers? And he said, yes, I can. And uh, we uh, tested those on, on many proteins and they seem to work very, very well. And um, to the extent that this, uh, this was patented and uh, commercialized as a product, which is called Nomi's Nucleants. And what is uh, nice about it, the bioglass, it resembles a grain of salt, both in size and in texture. So if you look at it, it's in a vial and you'd think you've just sort of been sold salt grains. And one grain is inserted manually into uh, drops as small as 200 nanoliters, so meaning even those with the robotic screens, which they put 100 and 100 you can put in, and you use it using very thin tweezers. And it can be applied with all crystallization methods. So if you look at it, here we were talking of crystals that couldn't be crystallized. Otherwise, here is a membrane protein, a multidrug resistant protein, and it's difficult to see on the picture on the left, which is a crystal and which is a nucleant, but sort of behind is a nucleant and the crystal is a sort of kind of a rod that you see. Beta lactamase also couldn't get crystals and you can see the nucleant is in the middle and the crystals, three crystals coming out of it. A better picture, sort of more close up, the spongy looking brownish stuff in the drop is the nucleant, and you can see this beautiful crystal, single crystal coming out of it, and on the other side also. So it's easy to put in, you take your tweezers and you put in one grain, and you want one or two grains, no more, because if you have too many grains, they will compete with each other and each take protein. You want one where the protein will uh, my protein molecules will migrate to. Now again, very important here is the conditions to use it in. It's got to be, for crystal, for crystal improvement, has got to be in the metastable zone. And what people have said that, oh, we took the bioglass and we put it and we got too many crystals. So I said, yes, but where, what conditions did you put it? They said, well, we put it in the conditions where we got the hit. So this is not the case. Of course, you'll get more crystals. That means it's doing its job very well. It's a nucleant. It will give more crystals. What you want to do is get into metastable conditions where you wouldn't get crystals otherwise, and then put the nucleant, and then you get, hopefully, one or two or a few. And uh, the left side shows again this uh, super solubility curve and how do you get that really people are doing this all the time without realizing because when they get a hit, then you get uh, certain conditions and you, for optimization, fine tuning, which everybody does, you go a little bit above the hit or below the hit. And you will get, con so you do say, I don't know, five, six, ten experiments above and below the hit. And you see where it is, where you get too many crystals. Of course, this is over supersaturated. Where you get, then you can get no crystals. And just at the point where you get no crystals, that is your metastable. So you don't want to go too low because otherwise you're going into the undersaturated, 
by which time, of course, in the undersaturated, no nothing will happen. You create on and there's no hormone. But if you get those between the drops, you will see. And as I say, people do it for seeding all the time, and they just don't realize that the nucleant is actually in that, in those conditions. So this is very important to note. So here again, improvement. There's a lobster protein you see on the left, just really rubbish crystalline shapes. And with the uh, bioglass, the crystals are actually blue. So there's an arrow showing the nucleant and then the crystals. And another one here, a modified cyclodextrin that's not even a protein, but a peptide. So it works for various things. Now, I can't say, of course, universal until something has worked for at least a thousand proteins. But what this table is showing that the bioglass has worked for um, proteins in different molecular weights. If you look through the table, going from 13 to 320 kilo Dalton, so really an order of magnitude uh, difference in molecular weight, and different precipitating agents and different pHs. So meaning it's not fussy about um, with many other nucleants, you've got to have a certain pH, a certain pi, a certain, uh, it will only go in salts or uh, only in pegs. Here uh, it does, it, it shows that it's got a variety where it works, but as I say for universal, I can't claim that till we get many more. Now, what is the secret of this bioglass and, and the porous materials at work is that, it's, that they have a distribution of sizes. So the size of pores is between 2 and 10 nanometer, and this is a Gaussian distribution, so of course one would have 0.5 and maybe some above the 20. And uh, the, so that each protein, so to speak, finds its comfortable bed. And that's why it works, because trying porous materials with uniform sizes and even bioglass, because I asked them to try to see whether bioglass of just two nanometer or just five or just 10, would that work? Um, and all these others listed here, they were much less effective. They may have been uh, useful for a protein with a similar size. So for example, lysozyme would crystallize in something in two um, nanometer or three nanometers but other things would not. So the distribution of size is really what, what uh, is a trick here. So we're very pleased with this and this works well, but still these nucleants to date, including the Naomi's nucleant, are mostly random substances. So they have properties like porosity and nanostructure, electrostatic uh, potential, but they don't have any specificity to proteins. And what really we sought is materials with specific affinity to proteins. So we know now that, pro that uh, pores work, so we wanted something porous, but something that will attract protein. And then came the idea that let's harness the proteins as templates to induce their own crystallization. And that came about because, again, I heard of somebody who is do, dealing with molecularly imprinted polymers, MIPS in short, they're also called smart materials, somebody in Surrey, uh, and who um, dealt with it for completely different purposes, for mimicking antibodies. And um, I called him and I said, Dr. Reddy, uh, would you be able to MIP for me or make me printed polymers of proteins that I could try and use for crystallization? And he did. And what are these molecularly imprinted polymers? They are, they are polymers, really like uh, acrylamide gel, or any gel, formed in the presence of a molecule that is extracted afterwards. And it, when it's extracted, it leaves cavities and the in these cavities uh, uh, say retain a memory of the gel, in the gel of that protein, after the molecule has been removed. So when it sees the molecule again, it's got highly sensitive rebinding to it. And therefore, people have been using it for 
separation and purification of things, um, recently a lot for mimicking antibodies. And in the context of proteins, they've been used mainly for purification in isolation, but never before to facilitate protein crystallization. So our hypothesis was that in the MIPS, they, they would uh, form the cavities, the pores, which we are after, but a pore which is sort of uh, recognizing the protein which made it, and therefore they should be, theoretically be ideal nucleants for themselves. So here's schematically the creation of a MIP, again simple to do. Uh, one just takes a monomer, say of acrylamide, and mixes it with protein. And those two mix and they sort of come together. And if one puts a cross-linker, then polymerization is initiated. And the gel um, sort of envelops the protein. And if you take the protein out, what you see on your left is a cavity, um, which is uh, remembering, exactly remembers what protein was there. So when it comes, it recognizes. It comes again. If it comes in contact with it again, it recognizes it. So what we did for every MIP that was created, we also created a non-imprinted polymer, what we call NIP, uh, which was uh, done using the same procedure, but without the protein template to serve as control, because one could have said that maybe the gels is just having the effect. And also, of course, always controls with no MIP or NIP the set. Now, the first thing we wanted to see whether we can get any improvement in crystals which were poorly diffracting or not diffracting. And the biggest success with this so far has been an HIV complex where it could only diffract to nine angstrom by standard techniques and with a MIP uh, went to 4.2 angstrom. So this is, of course, a big uh, change. Also, a human migration inhibitory factor. One can see on your left the uh, MIP, and the arrow shows the MIP. The MIP is like a gel, so it's a, it goes into the, you pipette it into the drop, and it looks like a sort of gooey gel in it. And you see the nice crystals, crystal coming out of it. Uh, next to it, just show the non imprinted polymer, meaning the, the control. Uh, again, just to show what it looks like. So it's a kind of a bit of a ganji, but it's it's focused in, in the middle of the drop. And diffraction results, in, in all cases, they were uh, better, or in the case of MIF, at least, in, in the home source gave like the synchrotron, other uh, proteins were uh, definitely better by quite a bit. Now then a, a very interesting and unexpected uh, result came. When we were doing it, the MIPS were made, for, several proteins were taken and made MIPS of them. And the, and the MIPS were used to crystallize that protein, its cognate protein. But we thought, let's try and cross, uh, cross them as well and see whether a MIP to a different protein will work for another. And if you look at this table, and say, for example, this MIP protein, it will give you crystals, of course, with a MIP, its cognate will give, but also gives crystals with a lyso L MIP, it stands for lysozyme MIP, T MIP stands for trypsin MIP. So you get crystals not only in its cognate, but sometimes with others. And if you look, it is for other proteins as well. You can see even the HIV complex, it will give crystals with the lysozyme MIP and the trypsin MIP. So what's happening here? When we embarked on the MIP experiments, we expected that each MIP would work exclusively on its cognate protein, because that was the whole thing, that it's very specific. It uh, binds a protein, it remembers that protein. And um, then in practice, we see that some MIPS are also inducing the crystallization of other proteins with a molecular weight of the same order of magnitude. So what we see that it's, it's not as specific, but of course, for crystallization purposes, this suits us very well, because if a MIP of one protein can successfully be used for another size compatible one, 
This is important for difficult to crystallize one, which are very scarce in supply, and you don't want to waste any of it for imprinting, and you can uh, benefit from the use of a related mic, which is much cheaper uh, and more available. So, so this was something, sort of an extra, uh, that we found with that. And then we uh, submitted a paper about it and wanted to, the referees came back and they said, oh, well, we will only be convinced if you also show us whether you get uh, hits with the MIPS, which you wouldn't get otherwise. So we had to go back to the bench and it took quite a while. And yes, we did. Uh, when you uh, uh, screen and add the MIPS, and again, you're doing anything between 200 to, to uh, 1, 2 microliter, and all you put in is a bit of MIP. You don't need a lot. You, you sort of dip your uh, pipette tip in the MIP solution. It's a sort of gel, uh, a viscous gel solution. You put it in, and as long as you see this bit of goo in the drop, it's okay. It's there. All you need is a bit of it in the presence. And these are um, examples, and here is a table here where we took, uh, this is using the index screen, we get for three target proteins um, between four and five hits that you would not get otherwise. Uh, and not only not get otherwise from clear, but not get even with other nucleants. So it has given beyond that. Uh, this is just of interest how the formation of the crystals with the MIPS are uh, happening. It starts when you look at it uh, with a phase separation, or it looks, you see that the, um, if you look at the top um, picture, uh, faintly you see the MIP, that's a sort of kind of the gooey uh, gel in there, and the arrow points to a droplet which is, uh, looks like an oil drop, but it is a uh, protein-rich, uh, obviously protein-rich, because after several days you see the droplets sort of uh, aggregating, and uh, 24 hours or however much later comes the big crystals from them. So it is a kind of a process where it starts as uh, oil-rich, not oil-rich, protein-rich, and gets it. It's not just a... Um, crystal coming out immediately. So to summarize MIP, they produce the hits that would have been missed in their absence. They produce high red quality crystals and it cor corroborates the hypothesis that you can uh, harness the proteins to uh, act as their own nucleants uh, for both screening and optimization. The MIPS are currently in the process of being commercialized because this is patented, but anybody who does want it can contact us. And as a, in the meanwhile, and it takes time until things get commercialized, uh, we can do it as a, a scientific collaboration. So we, we, would, uh, we, we wouldn't wait just for them to be commercialized.